Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 14th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week we talk about hard cider with the man who wrote the book on it. Ben Watson is the author of Cider, Hard and Sweet, History, Traditions, and Making Your Own. I've gotten several requests for a cider show since we started this podcast, and Ben does a great job of bringing us up to speed on the sweet, fermentable stuff. Also, Chris Colby from Brew Your Own Magazine joins us to give us a look at countertop partial mashing. Chris wrote an article in this month's BYO about how to use an unmodified two-gallon water cooler to take our mini mash to the next level. Speaking of Brew Your Own Magazine, in the October issue, there's a big article on brewing podcasts by Kristen Grant. Kristen did a great job of letting the BYO readers know about our little world of homebrew podcasting here. Along with Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video, Kristen talked at length about Jamil Zanishaf's show, Graham Sanders' Craft Brewers radio program, and Johnny Max's Brew Crazy show. She also talked about uh, some of our other podcasting buddies in the beer world out there. I do want to make one clarification. In the article, I'm quoted as saying, Basic Brewing Video is consistently in the top ten video podcasts in the iTunes podcast directory. I wish that were the case, uh, but in fact, what I, I thought I said and and what I should have said if I didn't was that we are in the top 10 food-related podcasts in the iTunes podcast directory. So still something to be proud of, but not quite as big as a, <laughs> an accomplishment as the top 10 overall uh, video podcasts. But anyway, uh, so I want to welcome everyone who's uh, joining us for the first time after reading Kristen's article. And once again, great job to Kristen, and thanks for helping to spread the word about homebrew podcasting. And incidentally, thanks to everybody who has subscribed to uh, Basic Brewing Video and Basic Brewing Radio and the iTunes podcast directory and helping to uh, boost our ratings up into that uh, lofty spot in the food-related category. Well, we've got a lot to talk about in the show this week, so I want to make a quick dart into the mailbag. I got a curious letter from Dave in Pittsburgh this week. Dave says, I split a 10-gallon batch of brown ale using Beano and and the dry and dry hopped it with two ounces of Saz in one of the five gallons. Dave says it was wonderful. It was and is one of the favorite of my brew buddies with only a 1.8% higher final gravity, and he may mean lower final gravity, than the non-Beano batch. FYI, it continued an active fermentation for an additional three days, Dave says. Well, now, my initial reaction to Dave's letter was, uh, huh? <laughs> now, Beano, you may be aware, is that stuff that's supposed to uh, prevent you from getting gas and bloating from gas and the other side effects that you get from gas when you eat, um, well, you know, beans, for example, and other, other gassy foods. Well, I, I did a Google search for Beano and brewing, <laughs> which I thought I would never do. And I found an article on the BYO website, uh, the, the Brew Your Own website. It's like the BYO show all of a sudden. It turns out that the Beano is an enzyme, uh, the name of which I am not going to attempt to pronounce. And some home, brewer, uh, home brewers have actually used it to make a very dry beer. And I asked Dave how his Beano beer turned out, and he says, actually, it was much more sweet than I had anticipated. The brew exhibited a malty character and a great mouthfeel with just a hint of warmth on the tongue. Though it was dry hopped with two ounces of size, it was slightly grassy, but it did not overpower the brew. Dave says, my wife liked it, and she will definitely tell me if it's hoppy. Incidentally, Dave says he used four Beano tablets in a five-gallon batch. One downside, according to the uh, BYO article, you may not be able to tell exactly when the Beano activity is finished, so you may accidentally bottle too early. And this, ironically, will cause an excess of CO2, apparently. Too much gas in your homebrew from the Beano. (laughs) Uh, I'll post a link to that article in the description of uh, this episode on basicbrewingradio.com, and you can make your own Draw your own conclusions from that. So I thought I thought that was fun. Thanks, Dave, for uh, sharing your <laughs> sharing your Beano experience. Uh, let's go on to our first interview, shall we? Uh, 
Uh, Chris Colby is the editor of uh, Brew Your Own magazine. His article on countertop partial mashing using a two-gallon unmodified drinking water cooler caught my attention, so I invited him on the show to tell us more. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back again to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me. Now, we've talked, uh, we've spent a whole show with uh, Kevin DeLang out in uh, Colorado on partial mashing. Uh, so I don't want to get in the details of partial mashing, but you put an interesting twist on partial mashing with something that is easy to use and I guess fairly inexpensive, just a regular uh, two-gallon drinking cooler. Yeah, an ordinary uh, two-gallon uh, beverage cooler. Uh, you can also use a three-gallon one. Uh, I mean, any you know Walmart or Sears or, or you know certainly any store that sells camping gear will have uh, plenty of them to choose from. This is just kind of a, a scaled-down version of uh, what people use for their mash tuns. Yeah, it's essentially. Um, I, yeah, I, I called the story uh, countertop partial mashing because the idea is it's just a small. Uh, partial mash that you can do uh, right on your countertop, you know, right next to your your brew pot, essentially, and uh, it just combines a couple different uh, techniques that have been kicking around out there in the homebrew community into, you know, a good way to make partial mash beer. Now, we the method that we talked about uh, with Kevin Delang was to use a grain bag in the in the brew pot. Uh, but talk talk about uh, take a step by step in in how you do it with the cooler. Yeah, well, you know the basics of partial mashing are are you know simply you uh, mix crushed grain with water. So um, you know given the scale the homebrewers do it on there, there's any you know amount or a very large amount of possible variables of ways to do it. The way I did it was. Um, I just uh, put the crushed grains in a big nylon steeping bag, um, put the hot water inside the little beverage cooler, uh, calculated beforehand how much water I would need so it didn't, you know, come all spilling out when I when I put the bag in, and then just submerged uh, the grain bag in the hot water. Um, and as, as I submerge it, just uh, take a brewing spoon and just sort of poke around at it to uh, make sure that you don't get any... Um, any little areas within the, the grain that are just, you know, completely dry and don't, and don't get any liquid attached to them. You don't want dough balls. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> what are the advantages of using this cooler as opposed to just uh, putting the grain bag in your kettle? I've done it th- that way, too, uh, putting in the kettle. One of the advantages, I thought, is just coolers are insulated, so it helps hold the temperature somewhat steady, um, you know, at, the, at this scale Four gallons, the uh, the temperature will drop a little bit, and then when it, when it goes to uh, you know comes time for sparging, you just you run off your your first wort, maybe recirc- recirculate a little bit first, and then you know for sparging you just put it you know you just fill the uh, cooler for a second time uh, because it's a batch sparge procedure, and just let it go. I mean the uh, there's, I have nothing against the you know partial mashing in your kettle. Uh, this uh, wasn't written as a you know way to improve upon that. It's just another way you can do it, and you know different people are going to pick uh, you know different ways to approach it. Well, a couple of the advantages that I could see was uh, probably better temperature control, and also you actually get to do a batch sparge in this little cooler as opposed to taking your grain bag. Out of the uh, out of the brew kettle and just pouring water kind of over the the uh, grain bag to to uh, to louder or not louder but to, to sparge. Right. Yeah. Your your uh, loudering should work a little bit better with this technique, I would say. And it also, I think, it allows you to do a little bit uh, use a little bit more grain in the partial mash. Um, we do in. Uh, in a lot of the BYO recipes, we do a sort of um, partial mash uh, a lot of times, and we usually limit it to about two pounds of grain because you've got to lift that grain bag out then and into the colander over your brew pot. And with, with this technique, you use about four pounds, which is twice as much. And if you were doing that in your brew pot, that's that's quite a lot to. I mean, it's not not that it's that heavy, but you know, just from a manageability, you'd need like a huge like strainer or colander to, to fit the grain bag in over your brew pot afterwards. 
and it's just you know a big mess of hot liquids or whatever that you know you could potentially uh you know you'd be dripping hot hot word all over yeah and it's it would be more difficult to do by yourself i guess yeah that's one thing this thing you can do entirely by yourself because the, the grains just sit in the bag the whole time and uh, you know in the in the bag and then in the inside the cooler and you know all you do when you're ready is you, you open up the top and uh you know run the word off and then add the water let it sit for five minutes and open up the top and run the word off again so you get the benefit with this partial mashing method as with standard partial mashing you get the benefit of being able to adjust the fermentability uh, of at least part of your wort with uh, mashing temperatures and then also you use the uh, late extract method in addition to using this uh, this cooler method uh, the way I explain it in the article is, yeah, you get your uh, partial mash wort, which when you're mashing four gallons, works out to you're maybe going to get you're maybe going to get around two gallons of wort, and then you add it. To, there'll be some boiling water already in your kettle, so you'll end up with about three gallons of wort, you know, made from the wort you run off plus uh, water in your kettle, and then you know you boil that. Uh, you'll probably boil down to about two and a half gallons after you know an hour boil and um then at the end of the boil or you know 15 minutes before the end of the boil you add uh liquid malt extract and this uh you know brings up the brings your beer up to the total amount of fermentables that you want in it but yet you don't boil the uh extract forever and i guess that uh, if you wanted to play around with all grain brewing this would be an easy way to get into it, and uh, you'd have to make smaller batches, but this would be kind of a, a you know, microcosm of all grain <laughs> with yeah, a small, you know, less in, investment. Yeah, if you all grain brewing, um, I mean, try this out a couple times, and then really the only thing you would need to change is you would need to get, like, a bigger cooler, and most batch barge coolers I have a little... Uh, Manifold made from like uh, stainless steel. Uh, what is it? It's like the stainless steel sleeve from like a water supply. Yeah, the mesh. Yeah, and those are really easy to make. At the uh, at the scale you're doing it on the countertop with the little cooler, you don't need it. The bag is enough, and uh, you know once you recirculate a couple cups of wort, it you know that that's enough to to set up the little uh, you know the filtration that you need of you know the wort to the grain bed. And, you know, with with a little bit larger, you will want to, to make the little manifold, but at this scale, you don't need it. And with a full, full-size full batch, you'll need a full-size uh, kettle to do a full boil. And, yep. and a lot yep. of people go to the the uh, outside propane burner because of the, the BTUs that you need to get that up to boil in a uh, reasonable amount of time. But this is a good, uh, this is, would be a good stepping uh, stone or a stepping, uh, a step do that yeah this is if you um i mean I, th- I think this can definitely take the the fear out of mashing you know a lot of times um i've always thought that a lot of the introductory home books homebrew books made mashing seem too complicated and you know if you if you try something like this you, you really get the picture that it's only you know at its heart steeping you know crushed grains in hot water right and, you know, you can certainly learn more about the process and, and uh, become better at controlling it and, you know, learn learn all the little tweaks. But at its heart, it's very simple to make wort. You you know, you can just by dunking, you know, a grain or a bag of grain in, you know, a two-gallon cooler full of hot water. And, you know, once you see that, you might say, hey, that's that's not that hard. <laughs> As with many things in home brewing, it's as it's as easy or as difficult as you want to to make it. Yeah, that actually is a very nice thing about mashing is the learning curve is very nice and slow. You can you can start out. Uh, I mean, I know people who have actually made you know used a five gallon got cooler and like a huge grain bag and essentially did this method, but all grain. You know, they didn't mm-hmm. build a manifold or anything, and it worked. It's just. No, the efficiency wasn't so good, and they got a lot of husk material, you know, because they didn't have a nice manifold and all that. But mashing is, at at its heart, it's very easy. Um, you can certainly, the more you learn about, you know, various methods, you can certainly, you know, get to the point where you're brewing German lagers and you're worried about, 
you know, the uh, how long your decoction is going to be boiled and, you know, what the, uh, what the mash thickness is going to be for the malt, you know, Germans use typically. Uh, for darker, you know, if, they're, if their base of the beer is Munich malt, they use a thicker mash than with Pilsner malt. And, you know, there's differences then uh, based on the sparge length because, you know, if you have a thinner... Uh, or if, yeah, if you have a thinner mash to begin with, you need less liquid to sparge through. And there's there's a ton of stuff to learn if you really want to get to that, you know, level. But on the other hand, if you don't want to learn any of that, just dunk your grain bag in some hot water. <laughs> well, this is a fun article and a, and uh, something that um, I've actually thought about uh, trying, but have never gotten around to. And it's it's interesting to see how it actually works. You should try it. Uh, you know, I think you'd like it a lot. Well, great. Well, thanks for thanks for joining us again, Chris. Okay, no problem. It's always fun to talk to Chris Colby. By the way, we were almost joined by a third in that in that conversation. Right as I stopped recording, his cat jumped on the speakerphone in the next room and hit the button. <laughs> that would have been interesting to, <laughs> to get his side of the whole countertop, you know, taking up part of the countertop with a cooler uh, instead of him. You can, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. You can get a free issue of uh, Brew Your Own Magazine by clicking on the banner ad on our basicbrewing.com site. And if you decide to subscribe after you read the free copy, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And thanks again to everybody who's uh, done so already, supported this podcast by subscribing through our little banner ad there. Now, as I said in the beginning, I've received several uh, requests since this podcast started last year for a show on how to make cider. Well, I've never made it, but Ben Watson has. He's the author of Cider, Hard and Sweet, History, Traditions, and Making Your Own. Ben Watson, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. Now, your book, Cider, Hard and Sweet, uh, History, Traditions, and Making Your Own, uh, here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're we're more probably toward the hard side, <laughs> right? But uh, tell me a bit about uh, your background in cider making. How did you get into it, and and uh, what's your favorite uh, uh, way of making cider? Well, I've always been interested in. Um, since I live in New Hampshire, we have a really good climate for growing apples, and I've always been interested in um, the heirloom varieties or old-fashioned varieties of apples, and I guess I came to it that way. Um, but also I have an interest in uh, home brewing, and also it, it seemed like a, a good uh, basic way to uh, to get into making wines or uh, ciders at home. And um, and uh, had an interest in it and had an opportunity to uh, uh, write a book about it, actually, and actually learned a lot while I was writing the book. And in the six or seven years since then, I've learned probably as much or more than I knew when I actually wrote the thing. So I'm doing a second edition pretty soon. Give us a bit about the history of cider in the United States. Sure. Um, well, cider is one of those, uh, it really it really is a sort of a prim- primary drink of of uh, the United States the early from early colonial times. And the reason being that a lot of the settlement was in um, northern states where um, Barley could not be grown very well, which obviously limited what they could do in terms of making their own ale. I mean, a lot of people of from England and Northwest Europe came over, and they were used to drinking um, ales and beers. And uh, but there was also a cider t- tradition, a, a long-standing cider tradition in Northwestern Europe as well. Um, and they found that they couldn't really um, they couldn't really make beer that successfully. They had tremendous amounts of wood, so heating it was no problem, you know, and and fuel and all that sort of thing. But they just couldn't grow some of the um, the hops and the barley um, that uh, were necessary to make good uh, good beer. So, um, but apples grew fabulously well in this country, and once those got established, they became a really homestead um, fruit and. Uh, and what would you do with, uh, you know, even one tree's production worth of cider? There was no way to really uh, keep them in long-term cold storage or no refrigeration units back then. So it was really one means of preserving the apple harvest that you got from your few trees on a farm. And at one point, um, one out of every ten farms in New England had its own cider mill. 
and uh, so it was very widespread and it it was used as it was in England it was used for um, not just drinking at home but it was uh, there was very little hard currency going around and it was actually used as a means of exchange hmm. uh, school teachers ministers would be paid partly or or not totally but partly in cider um, you know farm workers would be uh, part of their wages would come in cider that they would that they would get, and uh, actually um, that was an old, long-standing English tradition too. That I think was only outlawed in the middle of the 19th century. Finally, um, you know, up until then, it was legal to pay people part of their wages in cider. Well, I guess as long as everybody accepted it as a, as the currency, there wouldn't be a problem. Well, everybody drank it. Um, you know, everybody from little kids, uh, because there was a, also a great mistrust of the uh, water resources, um, partly uh, based on just suspicion, but also partly based on the fact that uh, people didn't know the niceties of uh, in colonial America of that uh, you know manure was great for your fields, and and so they uh, often played out a, a patch of fairly productive land and ended up using their cow manure and dumping it in the river. So mm. open water was not seen as a, as a real option. So <laughs> milk, beer, and cider were, uh, were sort of universally uh, consumed wherever they were available. And everybody from little kids, they used to drink a, a, a second pressing of the apple pumice that made a very, very weak, uh, you know, one or two percent alcohol cider. It was called cider kin or cider water. And they drank that, and uh, students at Harvard drank it, and as I say, farmhands drank it. Uh, you know, President John Adams, and uh, and every and, and all of our founding fathers uh, drank cider and enjoyed it. So it was uh, really it cut through all levels of society in those days. Was it uh, was it all hard, or were there methods of of making it sweet and being able to preserve it as well? Yeah, well, it's interesting. <clears throat> I mean, when you're talking about the term sweet and hard cider, nowhere else in the world is there a distinction between the two, and it really only came up in the in the days of prohibition when uh, temperance movement people and farmers who were sympathetic with that were actually chopping down their apple trees uh, mm. in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And they had to do something with the apples that they have left, and that's really what created uh, the market in this country and the term sweet cider to differentiate it from hard. But in England, if you say hard cider, it means a cider that maybe is a year or two too old and is kind of stale and not that great. Um, so it's kind of a derogatory term in other parts of the uh, the world, but here we say hard cider be- to differentiate it to make sure that we, you know, there's no confusion between the two. But back in those days, in colonial times, um, you know, there was no real way to preserve sweet cider as such because there was no refrigeration. It would, it would, you know, it turns as anybody knows who's bought a gallon of sweet cider and even let it go in the refrigerator uh, for more than a couple of weeks. It, uh, if it's natural sweet cider, it'll, it'll start to ferment on its own, and um, you can only keep it for so long. So. They made all sorts of products out of it, and hard cider is also <clears throat> the precursor to uh, to uh, making cider vinegar. You have to make hard cider before you can make cider vinegar um, at home. So, you know, that was such an important product for preserving all sorts of other kinds of food that vinegar was almost more important than uh, the cider itself. Now, where do we stand today as far as uh, commercial hard ciders that you might find in your in your liquor store or or in the grocery store in some places right how are those <laughs> well it it really varies quite a bit i mean when <clears throat> the interest in cider really ramped up first of all in the 1980s um after the you know which i'm sure you you and your your listeners are familiar with the the uh the, the sort of microbrew revolution and the laws that were passed saying that you could make 100 or 200 gallons of uh, your own stuff every year, you know, that sort of liberated people and, to, and, and also got them looking at different kinds of smaller scale products that weren't just done by major breweries. And um, cider was part of that. Uh, at the time, it was something that uh, the companies that were starting up were like Woodchuck, which is still a brand name uh, made in Vermont, but owned by a huge multinational company. Uh, and those styles of so-called draft ciders, um, even though they're mostly found in uh, 12-ounce bottles and six-packs rather than in, in uh, on draft these days. And that that's one style of cider, and unfortunately that 
became known as, you know, in most people's mind as what cider is. It's kind of sweet and fizzy and highly carbonated and, you know, shelf-stable for a long time. And uh, that's only one small style of cider. And it's not bad. It's refreshing, but it's it's usually made out of apple concentrate. It's not really, uh, you know, quote, natural, uh, like, uh, or, or certainly is not a high-quality product uh, as many of the ciders are becoming these days. Uh, in the 1980s and, and, and increasingly into the 90s and even today, um, orchardists are getting into growing more interesting apple varieties that are specifically um, valued for cider. Uh, varieties, some from Europe, some from America, uh, some that are totally inedible. You would spit mm-hmm. them out if you, if, you, uh, if you ate them because it's like sucking on a wet tea bag. But that kind of tannin... <laughs> In the in these apples, gives gives the cider that they produce. The cider is actually quite drinkable when you press those apples, and the hard cider that it makes has a real structure to it, just like wine. Now, a lot of wine grapes you wouldn't want to use as dinner grapes because of the same reason. They have a high level of tannin in them as well as sugar. So um, there has sprung up a whole artisan cider movement in various parts of the country. And now there are some quite good cider producers that are making ciders, uh, single variety ciders of, of certain varieties that you can, we can get into that if you want to talk about that. But, um, in general, just really good, uh, ciders that are sold like wines, because that's really what cider is. It's, cider is more akin to wine than it is to beer. When you say, you know, brewing cider, that's just a sort of a shorthand phrase, because in fact, you wouldn't talk about brewing wine. And uh, and cider is made much more like a wine. It's fermented, but not really brewed or heated. We have a similar discussion on mead, because uh, some people say they brew mead, and some people say they they just make mead. Uh, you know, because you can pasteurize the honey if you want to, and and you can also just uh, mix it with water and and pitch your yeast and go. So Ben, set us on the road to making good cider on our on our own. Let's start with. Uh, Picking the apples. How? What apples? Uh, do we pick apples, or do we go with a uh, a, a commercial uh, sweet cider to start with? How do you start? Well, the easiest way for somebody who doesn't have access to an orchard. I mean, the, the best way is to go out and select your own apples. If you have a good orchard near you, do a little bit of research, taste some apples, see what kind of qualities they bring. You know, are they are they acidic? Are they you know um, very sweet, uh, what kind of flavor do they have? That's a great way to do it if you if you have access to grinding your own apples on a small scale press, and a lot of people get into doing that. But if you're just starting out, um, it's perfectly okay to get find some sort of a sweet cider that you like to drink, and um, and just you know, it literally in my book, I try to to tell people. In fact, one of the things I'm going to do is put a new chapter in on sort of graduate level cider making because people have demanded that but i wanted to start out with how easy it is to start with you know really just find a recycled one gallon jug (laughs) at your local landfill or a restaurant or something and (laughs) and uh, get a wine jug and uh, you know uh, start out by putting it in there putting an airlock on the top of it and it's really as simple as that Um, you know if you want to have uh, more consistent results it, it helps to use a cultured wine yeast, like a uh, Pasteur Champagne yeast is usually very reliable, and a lot of cider makers don't even go any farther than that. They just use Champagne yeasts uh, because they tend to ferment at colder temperatures, and uh, they also ferment pretty much to completeness. They'll ferment to dryness if you let them go that far. So... Um, you know, it's ridiculously easy to make cider. I mean, if I can make cider, anybody can. And that's one of the reasons I I really wanted to encourage people in the book to to try it out. Because, I mean, how much are you out? The worst, worst case scenario if you make a gallon of cider is you're out maybe five bucks for the cider if you buy it retail. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of the equipment you either have or you can scrounge around for, you know, literally just a couple of bucks. And uh, it's it's a very low risk proposition. Yeah, especially home brewers. You know, we've got the stuff already. Yeah, racking tubes, you know, stuff like that. But it's so much easier. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to heat the wort, and you don't have to chill the wort. You don't have to deal with the wort at all. You're just, 
literally you're just fermenting the juice and letting it do what it would do naturally, encouraging it when when it's in your interests to open it up to the air, <clears throat> which is in the primary part of the fermentation. You you actually leave the vessel open when you first put the fresh cider into it to let the air get to it because it'll ferment so rapidly at that point that it protects the cider from uh-huh. the carbon dioxide that's being released, protects the cider. But then after that first heavy um, burst of uh, fermentation goes, then you just put an airlock on top of it and fill it up with you know sanitary solution or water, and um, and you just protect it from the air. Because what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to have the uh, organisms that uh, acetobacter that that will turn it into vinegar will get in there if you just leave it open to the air. I mean that's essentially how you make vinegar. It goes through the stage of being hard cider, but if you put it in a big big crock and you leave it at a warm temperature, you're going to end up with vinegar eventually. So let's step back a couple of steps. Sure. Uh, what are your favorite apple varieties? And and should should people look for local uh, varieties? Because we were talking the other day and you said that, uh, you know, there are local varieties all over the country. Yeah. I mean, there are certain varieties that cider makers will will look for that are sort of historically important for making cider. One of the ones that I can think of is um, a variety called golden russet. I mean, in general, though, all russet apples, which just means that they have kind of a brownish fawn, fawnish brown color on the uh, part of the outside of them, will make pretty good cider if they're true russet apples. But there's a variety called golden russet that is from New York State. There's also an English golden russet, too, but this is the American one. And it's an old variety, and it has a ton of sugar in it, and uh, so it ferments to a fairly high percentage. And that, that's another thing to point out, too, that as opposed to wine, <clears throat> cider will usually will almost never reach the same kind of strength as a, as a grape wine because apples by weight simply do not have as much sugar in them as, as um, uh, grapes. Hmm. So, you know, whereas you'll see in a hot climate like California, you can get a... 15 or even higher, uh, sometimes 14, 15 or even higher percentage alcohol by volume in the in the finished uh, wine. Um, a cider typically won't go. Oh, typically if you're making it at home, it, it'll go somewhere between five and a half and six percent. But I've made ciders that have been as strong naturally without adding any sugar as eight percent. Seven and a half or eight hmm. percent, but it's tough to get much higher than that unless you add sugar to it. And I guess you could if you wanted to. You could add sugar to it. it I make a distinction in the book, and, and most people make a distinction: is if you're adding sugar to it and it goes above ten percent alcohol, it technically is an apple wine or hmm. nine or ten, at nine or ten percent alcohol. If you're adding sugar to it, which is fine, it's just a you know it's a distinction maybe without a difference. If you like it a little bit stronger and you want to add sugar to it. I, I've also added raisins to my cider when it, in a primary fermentation. And uh, that makes a style that is known as uh, New England cider. And again, the raisins are great because they add not only extra sugar, but they also add tannins from the grapes. So, um, you know, it makes a very distinctive kind of style. Now, I've read in uh, Zymergy, uh, the, the latest issue, issue of Zymergy that the um, and I've forgotten his name and I've neglected to bring the magazine into the studio, <laughs> but the uh, cider maker of the year, uh, they talk about uh, his using pasteurized cider, uh, and we talked the other day and you don't. Yeah, I don't use pasteurized cider. Um, I I sort of respect people who 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 want to. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. You can make. You can make cider out of pasteurized juice. Um, again, in that case, you really almost have to use a cultured yeast strain and pitch it with yeast because what you're doing by pasteurizing it, obviously, is you're killing off everything in the cider. Hmm. You're killing off all the bacteria, all the um, naturally occurring yeasts. I, I don't use it more for a philosophical and political standpoint than anything else because I feel that um, not only the the flavor, I I don't believe that pasteurized cider tastes anything like real cider, and um, so I have been really on a campaign. And in this part of the book, I really rail on the sort of the government over 
over-regulation of uh, small cider pressers. Um, it's very difficult now to, to find real cider, and, and some people will have no choice but to use pasteurized cider because that's all you can buy if you don't have an orchard nearby that, um, that presses their own and does not pasteurize. But the good news is that it really doesn't make any difference from a health standpoint, which is the whole reason that people are being forced to pasteurize, because there's never been an incident. Uh, the, the reason that, that uh, there was one incident that happened in the mid-'90s that caused um, a lot of people to be very nervous about unpasteurized juices, where one person actually died, and other people have gotten sick, but that's people who are making bad cider out of apples that they have no business pressing. Mm. So it's a matter of regulation. But but uh, the, the thing about hard cider is once you ferment the cider, there's been no, there's never been a case of anyone getting sick from, um, or at least except from overconsumption, I guess, <laughs> of hard cider. Um, there's been no sort of bacterial or intestinal problems from that. So it appears that uh, almost everybody universally agrees that fermentation destroys E. coli bacteria, which is one of the one of the kind of things that people are concerned about. Yeah, I've had E. coli a one five seven eight seven, so. You don't want it. It's not you... <laughs> fun. No, it's not a nice thing. But but it also yeah. it's it, the, the chances of getting it also are, are vanishingly small if you're using apples that are hand picked for one thing. I mean, a lot of the problem is that pasteurizing can also cover up uh, problems with. It's sort of an easy fix, but it also means that people will take shortcuts, like they will use drops and, and other kinds of fairly unclean fruit. Um, so I actually trust people who I know hand pick their fruit and wash their fruit and and I trust that cider a lot more than I actually trust the healthfulness of pasteurized cider in some cases where I don't know where it's coming from. And and like you said for the same reasons that uh hard cider was safe back in the colonial times because of fermentation it's safer today because of the fermentation. Exactly. It's it's it really um you know, whatever it is that uh, that causes the, uh, the the problems, which is fairly well known. I mean, it's the, it is that strain of E. coli you mentioned. I mean, even if you have a concern, a legitimate concern about that, it's not going to be an issue um, with hard cider. So we've got our raw materials. We've got our apples or we've got our cider. And we've got our sanitized jug that we're going to put it in. Um, and we just pitch our yeast and and let it go for a while. Then when it settles down, we put the airlock on and... And that's it. That's pretty much it, except for uh, you know just letting it. Uh, I, I tend to let mine age for a while. I know some people say one, one time I was at an orchard and in October, and uh, the the woman there it's a it's an orchard near where I live, so they knew that I had written a book about cider. And the young woman said, uh, "Well, I'd love to make a batch of this uh, hard cider. Definitely, I, I'm going to do it." And I said, "Well, that's great." And she said, "Well, I'm going to make some for my." boyfriend for Christmas. And I said, well, <laughs> I think you're a little late getting started because it doesn't take that long. Uh, it may only take a, a month or two, but I mean, cider tends to improve. It doesn't require long-term aging like mead, which really doesn't taste like anything for a year or so um, after you've after it's finished fermentation or after it's bottled. But it, it, it improves, I think, uh, in bulk storage for a while. Just forget about it for a while and let it sit, unless you're really anxious to start drinking it. So, so what are the time frames? What's the the time frame for uh, primary fermentation? And, and do you rack it to a secondary fermenter? And then, uh, you know, what's the time frame for uh, when you can bottle it? And you know, take us through the details. I normally rack it once. Um, and it, it's hard to generalize because it all depends on how, um, really, the climate and where you have it. I mean, I happen to have mine on a on an outside wall in a closet um, um, at, the, at the side of my house that is on an, out, an insulated wall, but it's an outside wall, so it stays fairly cool in there in the winter time. So that's another reason that I sort of leave it to let it go for a while because um, often what will happen is that if I leave a five gallon carboy of cider. Um, that I've started in October over the winter, it'll stop fermentation entirely, and then it'll pick up again in the spring. Hmm. Not vigorously, but you know, def- will, it will definitely start fermenting again. And what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to bottle it too soon uh, for fairly obvious reasons, right. because unless you're using very strong uh, glass, you're, you're going to be having bottles exploding on you downstairs, which is not a pleasant experience in your cellar. 
Um, or worse yet, in your hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you don't want to gusher when you open up a bottle of of your cider to serve to friends. You don't want to have half of it end up in the sink or on your best friend's lapels or something. Uh, so it's it, it's it's one of those things that it, and it's better to it's better to ferment it to dryness and be sure that it's completely or almost completely fermented, rather than to and, and then adjust the seasoning. If you want it, if you want it a little bit sparkling or, or effervescent, add a dosage of sugar to it and just do some bottle conditioning. And, and that's another thing that, that uh, normally takes, oh, I don't know, a month or so after you bottle it. It's, it's good to just let it sit and let it carbonate a little bit. Um, so I would say from, from beginning to end, roughly, usually about three or four months. Is there a way, if you want a sweeter tasting cider, that you can stop the fermentation at some point in the process? Or do you, is that an advisable thing to do? Yeah, there are various um, there are various ways you can do that. You could do it with. Um, I tend not to use very much sulfite in mine. I do put some. Uh, norm- normally, what I do is uh, I normally sulfite the cider if I'm going to use a um, a cultured yeast, a pasture, uh, you know, like a pasture champagne yeast. I will add the day before um, a little bit of Campton uh, tablet uh, powder. To the to the gallon jug or to the carboy that I'm using, and ki- sort of suppress all of the wild yeasts and organisms in there before, so so that the the yeast that I want to to use gets a good foothold and gets going pretty quickly. Hmm. And wine yeasts are much more sulfur tolerant than than uh, natural yeasts are. So a little bit of sulfite will knock down that. Uh, I, I know people who 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 put uh, a little bit of um, crush up some Campton tablets and put a little bit more in every time they rack the cider. I think that's fairly unnecessary because cider has uh, is acidic enough that it has a sort of a, uh, a bit of protection, except from aerobic organisms. I find that it doesn't, you know, spoilage organisms unless tend not to affect cider too much. I mean, they do. Sometimes things go horribly wrong, but it, 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 uh, it's very rare in my experience. But if you wanted to stop the fermentation, that would be a way to to really knock it back. To add um, a, a solution of um, uh, uh, the Campton tablets, uh, crushed Campton tablets, potati- potassium metabisulfite. Um, so some people do that. Uh, you could conceivably um, pasteurize it, do in bottle pasteurization. In other words, bottle it and then bring it up to a uh, 165 degrees or so, and uh, and pasteurize it in the bottles. Um, there are a couple of commercial cider makers who do that to keep a residual sweetness. Hmm. Um, and you can also sulfite it, and then if it's dry, back sweeten it a little bit with some kind of a, a sweetener, as long as the yeasts don't take over. One way that commercial cider makers do it is by um, microfiltration, uh, which are fairly expensive. I mean, that's sort of an advanced technique that most people will not get into. But if you do that for some reason for your beer, or or some if you're filtering your beer with micro uh, micro pads or something and taking the yeast out of it, that's another um, that's another technique to keep a to keep a cider naturally low in alcohol and with residual sweetness. Now, you you use the term cultured yeasts uh, and natural yeasts. Is there a way to Make a quote unquote spontaneously fermenting cider? Sure. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is let it go. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing as when it starts to go and you, is when it starts to get fizzy in your refrigerator. It's, ah. it's, it's starting to ferment. Uh, you know, that's what you're getting. And, and the whole range of yeasts from, they're not wine yeasts or beer yeast, they're Candida and Klecora and a bunch of other minor natural yeasts, probably. You know, unless you're unless you're living in the middle of a winery out in California, I guess, mm. in which case you have a lot of load of Saccharomyces. But um, but yeah, I mean, you can make perfectly acceptable cider. The thing is, it's not very controllable. Mm-hmm. Um, so nine times out of ten, you'll probably get something that's very um, interesting and sometimes extraordinary. But uh, you, you know, the guarantee. other time it will get you'll get something very funky mm. and. Uh, and, and and again, I I don't make big batches of natural si- of naturally um, fermented ciders, but sometimes I'll make a one or two gallon batch of it. In talking again the other day, it seems like to me that you're sort of a cider purist. Uh, 
uh, because I asked you about uh, adding spices or, or other uh, flavoring ingredients, and you kind of said, mm, you know, not so much. Well, I, I don't know that it's a, as much of a sense of being a purist as it is. I am still learning about it, I feel, and and I like to see what different apple varieties and dip, and different uh, varieties, you know, the main, named varieties of apples do and, and how they contribute to a cider blend. And when you start putting in um, cinnamon sticks or other fruits or something like that, you don't get... I mean, you're throwing a lot of variables into your cider, and you can't really tell at the end what's contributing to what. You can make something wonderful and drinkable, and I have no problem with doing that. I've, I've, heard, I've made raspberry cider before, where I've hmm. put raspberries, whole raspberries, in uh, in the initial fermenting stage, and uh, you know, it's lovely stuff. But in order to, it doesn't really tell me much about what the, what uh, the underlying apple varieties are contributing to it. So you can explore uh, the natural flavors in the same way that you can experiment with different malts and different uh, specialty grains in making a beer. Uh, there's like infinite combinations of that. I guess there are uh, many, many different combinations of different uh, varieties of apples that you can use to, to kind of uh, come up with natural flavor variations without heading for the spice rack. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And But also the other thing is that... <clears throat> Uh, I find when when you're taking an apple, if you've got something that has a really distinctive taste that might be wonderful as a dessert apple, like for instance, uh, oh, there's a there's an old variety, an old French variety called Pomme Grise, or it might be a Canadian variety too, and um, it has a very nutty taste to it. That's not usually something you don't really want that kind of a distinctive taste in your final cider. What you want is something that's going to give you esters and tastes that are from, you know, that are more fruity. Um, I mean, that's what people are usually going for. You don't really want a nutty cider or a balsamic cider or, a, you know, herbal cider. <laughs> I, it, 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 it tends to taste off. Those flavorings tend to get translated in fermentation to something very odd when you're doing it. So it's usually better just to adjust the main components of, you know, look for your, when you're blending apples together, Try to blend ones that have some acidity to them, more acidity like, um, oh, well, there's, uh, I mean, uh, most North American apples are actually good for making cider because they, most dessert varieties have a blend of sugars and are, they're fairly high in sugars and they're fairly high in acids. So uh, some of the ones that are at the grocery store, you know, uh, are fairly low in acid, comparatively speaking. But a lot of the older varieties, the older heirloom varieties, are much better for making cider than, say, you know, a Pink Lady or a Honey Crisp or something like that. Because they're not – people uh, taste, apparently, or the mass culture taste is not thought of as, as – enjoying sprightly that's sort of the term for when you have a, a lot of acid in an apple you know a sprightly taste um, I prefer it and a lot of people in New England prefer that kind of taste but you know in the supermarkets you will not find a lot of really tart apples but that's something that contributes to a good cider a balance of sugars uh, acids and tannins that's what you're really looking for and, and in some sense an aroma too but you know, Macintosh apples have a great aroma, um, and I use some of them in my cider, but it's easy to – you don't want any one element to overwhelm the rest of it. I mean, Red Delicious apples can contribute to a good cider base, but they're not a very interesting apple. Um, you know, so you just have to – you have to mix, you have to experiment, and you have to see what you like. Are there any uh, any tips that uh, that you can think of that are, say, for instance uh, – common mistakes or common uh, uh, things that people overlook when they're doing their first cider? Boy, you know, there are so few things that can really go wrong, but um, <laughs> people manage to screw it up. I mean, some people, I, I've had people who have written to me and have said, uh, gee, um, what's, uh, you know, what's, a, uh, what, what's wrong with my cider? I started this big batch uh, in my garage, and that's sort of the key. When they say garage, I mm -hmm. go, oh, okay. Because, you know, you wouldn't make 
you wouldn't you wouldn't go out and get Cabernet Sauvignon grapes and crush them and put them in your garage next to your your car and you use motor oil. I mean, it, it's a lot of it is just the if you keep conditions sanitary and you have it you know in a place that is fairly you know odor free and and uh, um, and 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 you put on the airlock and just exclude air from it during the period where it's fermenting. There really is very little that can go wrong with cider in the normal course of events. Are there flavors from a green cider uh, that may scare people at first uh, that will go away as the as the cider mellows? Yeah, I mean, if you've used sulfites in in your cider, um, sometimes if you've used quite a bit of uh, you know sulfur, and and I again I tend not to use very much because I think a little bit helps protect the cider in storage but um and and uh prevents you know disease organisms or bacteria or whatever from growing in it but if you that that is sometimes a taste that people perceive when they take the airlock off and they smell it and certain yeasts will sort of produce more sulfur compounds too but that's that's the sort of thing that will tend to disappear in storage. And there are various other flavors, yeah. They, I mean, it may just be very acidic when you first try it, and you go, mm, that's not really pleasant. But that's why I suggest, after you bottle it, not drinking it for a few months, for a couple of months anyway. And that's the, probably the hardest part. Yeah, I mean, te- <laughs> I tend to uh, make cider in the fall um, and not drink it until probably about the following Memorial Day. That's my sort of rule of thumb for where I live and the conditions that I make it in. And there's a there's an annual event up in your neck of the woods uh, called Cider Day. Right. T- tell us about that. Well, Cider Day is um, has been going on now. This is, the I think, the 12th annual Cider Day. It really is the largest um, event of its kind in the country. It's sort of just a celebration of apples and... Um, and uh, cider and cider culture, and um, it's grown quite a bit over the last few years. We have uh, a lot of amateur cider makers. It started out with a lot of people who were into home brewing and um, and home home scale cider making, but it's also um, it also attracts um, quite a few commercial cider makers, and uh, it's a great chance to try various ciders from all over the country. We have a big an event called the Cider Salon, where you get to sample. You know, this year, there'll probably be about 15 or 20 different ciders um, <clears throat> from everywhere, from Washington State to uh, uh, the Upper Midwest to uh, to New England. And uh, so it's a, it's just an interesting event. And we've got dinners, we've got workshops. There are a lot of orchards in the area where it takes place, which is uh, sort of West Central Massachusetts. It's an old apple growing area. And uh, so there are um, workshops at the orchards. Uh, we have workshops on uh, what went wrong with my cider, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cider making basics, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a two day event. It's called Cider Day, but it's actually grown so big that we've had to make it a two day event. <laughs> and the web, if anybody's interested in checking it out too, it's on the web at www.ciderday.org. And I can put a link to that uh, in the episode description of this episode on uh, basicbrewingradio.com. Always the first weekend in November because that's when you can get the best variety of apples for making cider, late October, early November. Well, northwest Arkansas, uh, where I live, used to be uh, the sort of Washington state of its day, uh, you know, a few generations ago, and there are just a, a handful of apple orchards left around here, so I'm I'm looking forward to sampling uh, some of the local apples and uh, and trying some of the cider and and uh, and trying to make one of these. I've never made one, but I've yeah, and that's really to. that's really important that you bring that up because <clears throat> part of the um, part of the appeal of cider is it's one of those value added products that uh, people are are who are into it want to know more about it and they want to try different varieties and I think that that's going to be one of the strategies for um, keeping a lot of these smaller orchards going and financially um, you know viable because obviously uh, the the whole wholesale business in apples is very very difficult these days for for uh, Americans to get into I mean we're getting apples from China from Chile from New Zealand out of season apples and we've really devalued and I don't think a lot of people know a lot of these old-fashioned varieties 
Um, I do a lot of work with the Slow Food Movement, and uh, Slow Food USA, the national office, has has a whole program on uh, celebrating these apples and promoting them, and also a, um, a whole program on artisanal American ciders that they have. Um, so that's that's another good way to learn a lot more about um, cider and apples, and uh, and try to uh, you know start a start an apple and cider culture in this country to to save some of these prime old orchards. Yeah, these are it's a precari- they're in a precarious position because uh, you know the weather is so uh, can just devastate a crop. You know, with one late frost, uh, it 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 seems like to me it, it's a very difficult business to stay into. It is, it is. But uh, you know, there's some great apples that have come out of Arkansas too. There's a there's a good variety that's really useful for cider called King David, which is a Arkansas apple from the 19th century. And uh, Arkansas Black is a famous variety, and I think Ben Davis, which is an old old fashioned variety, I believe that's from Arkansas. Mm. I'm not quite sure. It's a southern apple. Um, up here, we grow it um, in New England too, sometimes. But it was really uh, it was one of those early sort of shippable apples, and they used it was it's so hard. The virtue of it was that it's so hard that they used to just shovel literally shovel them into to uh, railroad cars and, wow. and bring them up north to market. And they're, they're kind of, the old fashioned apples are, are not as big and pretty as the as the ones that we see in the market today. It's true, yeah. But you know, apples are one of those things that, uh, again, there's they have a there's a use for every different apple. I mean, some of them are great for making sauce and really cook down well, and some of them are better for making pies. And I think they're just a hundred years ago there was much more of a connoisseurship of apples, and people knew more about you know what different apples were like, and they really sought out certain varieties, and they said, well, this is best for this, and this is best for making apple butter, and this is best for you know. Uh, apple strudel, uh, you know, very specific uses. And I think there's a lot less of that these days. There's more of a one-size-fits-all mentality. And that's, again, what we're trying to counter at Slow Food, you know, the fact that there's a whole world of these apples. There are thousands of named varieties, and some of them are people try them and they just knock their socks off. They have so much flavor. Mm -hmm. And And the ones at the market now, I mean, they're better than the mealy red delicious that used to be out there. But they're they're fairly one dimensional. They're just sweet and crisp and watery uh, compared to anything you can buy locally. That's a really interesting variety. Well, you're making me hungry, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I'm thinking about apple pie and <laughs> must be getting close to lunchtime. Uh, and this is and I can't wait to uh, do to do my first batch of cider. Now you've you've made it sound really easy. It really is pretty foolproof. I mean, there. are yeah, it is. It, there, you can you can make a bad batch of cider, but it's pretty hard to to do that consistently, and it's pretty easy to find out what you did wrong if you did do something wrong. <laughs> well, I have to call you back up after I uh, after I do mine. Well, I, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I appreciate your time. Not a problem. Great to be with you. Well, thanks again to Ben Watson for setting us straight on cider. You can check out a, a link to Cider Day and to uh, Ben's book on basicbrewingradio.com in the description of this episode. Well, next week, I hope to have radical brewer Randy Mosher to talk about fruit beers. I also want to pick his brain about pumpkin beers while he's on the line since we're coming up on the on fall and the holiday season. If you have uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In our first DVD, Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in our second DVD, Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We talk about Stuff like uh, batch sparging and fly sparging and uh, step mashing and infusion mashing and just just have a ball doing it. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online 
Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. Thank you.